I really love the the topic that he's going to be talking about, Olympic optimism and digital dreams. So, yeah, without any further ado, over to Henk. Thank you very much, Henk. Thanks for joining us. You make me feel like I'm alive again. Okay. Ah, yes. So, Olympic optimism, digital dreams, a very positive title, but today's talk is a little bit about uh, failure, reflection on failure, root causes, and of course, how we can approach it, particularly failure and digital transformation in a way that could mitigate it at least. So uh, with that sort of in the back of my mind, I'm assuming that most of you would have been involved in one way or another with digital transformation initiatives. Maybe you led it, maybe you built the solutions for it, maybe you were a business owner, maybe you just had to fund it. Maybe you benefited from it as a customer or end user. Maybe you were a victim. But uh, if uh, maybe maybe in the, maybe combinations of the above. Now, if you if I had to ask, maybe just sort of a general perception show of hands. If I had to say a typical digital transformation initiative, or make it a little bit broader, IT business tech initiative, would you who would say that generally they come in on budget or under? I thought there would at least be some, but okay. So I'm not going to ask the second question because we know now what your what your answer is. So, so interesting enough, a few years ago, and no doubt many of these studies are done, but a, a really large study of this kind was done uh, 2017 based on 13 years of uh, IT project data. Uh, so not digital transformation per se, IT projects. So let's use that as a bit as a proxy. Um, 4,600 and something projects, and it wasn't just in the US or uh, Western Europe. It was really um, six continents, 66 countries. And and actually the, the um, whoops, am I going the right way? Yes, the results, apologies for a graph so early on in a presentation. Sure, I'm breaking some kind of rule, but the actual um, the actual results were actually quite interesting. And and if you if you look here on the left, this big spike is of projects projects in that line are where the actual cost, so the the cost at the end, uh, was equal to the originally planned estimated cost. And what you can see, and this was even surprising for me, and I've done this for two and a half decades, is is that there's far more of a concentration of of projects either under, on, or just over uh, their budgets, then, uh, i.e., the actual budgets, the money that was spent compared to the original estimates, then one one may be led to believe. Um, uh, but the, the the that's the good news. The scary part of this of this picture of this distribution is what lies here on your right, which and that's probably why we most of us have that negative perception. Uh, because when these initiatives go wrong, they have the tendency or the propensity, I would say, to go wrong really badly. So, so this is not a nice bell curve that finishes over here. Uh, IT projects, when they go wrong, can be twice as cost twice as much, three times, four times, five. In fact, when the data is modelled, uh, the guys doing the research. Uh, basically postulated that there's no limit, and that's what this little bump is here, there's no limit to how bad <laughs> an overrun really can be in this space. So, so, and the fear they had when they'd done this study is that most people, when they are doing this type of planning, uh, they don't consider the, the potential for ending up in this disaster zone, which is a real disaster zone, of course. In fact, that most of us, even when we think we're planning conservatively, end up in that middle space. Let's say it's a 100 million rand initiative, right? We may be going, well, we're going to try and make a 10, uh, save 10 or 15, and get it at 90 or 85 on the one hand. But maybe if we're a bit more conservative, we're going to put a contingency of 20 million aside, right? Um, but we may be doing that without realizing where this thing could really be at. And I think some of us have had that experience as well. Now, this was done by a, 
a guy called Ben Fluberg, I'm pretty sure I pronounced that Danish surname long, and colleagues. And, and they also wrote a book um, recently, and you may have heard about it or read about it. Uh, it's a fantastic book, How Big Things Get Done, by himself and Dan Gardner. And in this book, they actually bring all these studies they've done on all kinds of projects, not just IT, but also others together. And so there's an interesting table there that really uh, caught my eye that compared the this propensity for extreme cost overrun, so the danger for extreme cost run across various types of initiatives, types of projects. So, surprisingly, here behind me in the green corner, solar, wind. So these are initiatives. So if you implementing a, a solar type, type of installation or solar type project or wind power, uh, you are at very low risk of getting the ending in that sort of long fat tail of that graph uh, that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, there's a few things in the middle and then on the, in the other corners is, it would be the danger zone. And, and the sort of initiatives that you see this is, is most is sort of, even though we may not be experts in those fields, it's kind of what you think, right? Nuclear power plants, um, storing nuclear nuclear waste, you know, very well known, tricky, multi-decade uh, programs often. Um, hydroelectric dam, uh, building airports, and there's some classic case studies of Berlin and Denver. You know, if you're a project manager, every textbook always refers to these long-running disasters. And, uh, and something like the Olympic Games, you know, we think of uh, Montreal that I think only the other day paid off the debt that they, that they made when they, uh, after doing the Olympics back, uh, back in the 70s, or, or, you know, Athens, the Athens Olympics, that, that's generally considered um, to have contributed to Greek sort of final sort of default and, and collapse of economically uh, a decade or two ago. So, it's then indeed a little perturbing for for those of us in the in the world of IT and software implementation and digital transformation to find that as per that previous picture, IT projects end up in that in that danger zone, that sort of zone where if things go wrong, they have the tendency to go badly wrong, not just double but triple, quadruple, and, and so forth. And I thought it may be interesting, uh, since my world is mostly IT and digital transformation, and I've been for some time, I thought it would be interesting to, to, to see if there's some commonality, some shared vulnerabilities between the IT digital transformation world that I know and some of these others. And, and I had to pick one, and I thought, well, the Olympic Games is certainly a little bit more something that most of us in the audience can sort of think about and from a popular imagination perspective. So, so and that, that, that's today's, the, the first part of my, uh, my, uh, of our discussion today is to, to reflect on some of those common uh, vulnerabilities between digital transformation on the one hand and something as very different as a city preparing itself to host a mega event like the Olympic Games. And I think the first thing that I that all that I think is uh, the first clue, so to speak, is the type of language that's used. I mean, when we speak about, I mean, just the word digital transformation, it's transformational, right? Cities that, uh, that sort of target becoming um, the hosts in their process of bidding, you know, they might talk about taking their city deep into the future. It's very aspirational. It's very visionary. You know, they, the words like disruptive, uh, revolutionize, right? That's why I had it up there. You know, this is not the language of organic change. This is not the language of let's evolve. This is sort of we have to have a revolution to leap ahead to our competition or other cities or just so that we can participate in society or business in a particular way. And the problem with, with that type of language is it feels something that's called, and you may have heard of this, the planning fallacy. Now, the planning fallacy is a very human thing, where on the one hand, while well, we're planning uh, for something big or small, uh, as individuals or teams or organizations, while we're planning, we underestimate or downplay uh, effort, risk, costs on the one hand, and we overestimate quite naturally the benefits or the potential opportunities that may come from the situation. So this is one of those predictably irrational human behaviors. And it's quite powerful. Uh, even when confronted with past evidence, so the earlier studies of this uh, done by psychologists like Peer, they show that even when confronted with past evidence that in fact the 
costs and risks and effort are probably higher and the benefits in that are probably at a greater risk. Humans will nevertheless go ahead and, and plan accordingly. And that is because uh, the planning fallacy is a variant of something else called the optimistic bias, which Daniel Kahneman has described as uh, in his book, Thinking Fast Slow, you may have read that too, or heard about it, he described it as the most significant cognitive bias. Uh, not necessarily because it's the strongest, but uh, his view is that in terms of its impact on our lives, how we live, how we operate, how we operate as a society, it's the bias that probably has the most impact on how we approach our life. And if you're wondering about the picture in the background, uh, that's my most personal recent, <laughs> and some of my team are smiling at me here now because uh, about three months ago, I'm filled with optimism and, of course, completely underestimating, overestimating my skills and underestimating the danger. I went for a mountain bike downhill race in George, and it was fantastic, and I felt great, and, you know, and I chuckled to myself about how I was in my 50s doing this with teenagers and how wonderful that is. And of course, I stopped thinking that when I was lying there in the trees and <laughs> you know, feeling sorry for myself. And, and that particular picture was a few hours later, George Medi Clinic, which is a great place, I have to say, a fantastic place. Um, you know, they took the muddy guy in and they fixed me up. So uh, <laughs> anyway, so a, a significant bias that we all are vulnerable to, and certainly both these types of projects that we're talking about. Then uh, there's, a, there's a term that was coined actually by Flifberg in a, in a similar study, um, also described in the book, called eternal beginner syndrome. And, he, and this was coined to describe, in fact, uh, a challenge that Olympic host cities typically have. And the idea is, well, it's nothing new to host the Olympic Games, right? But every four years, it's a new city. So every city that does it effectively is doing it for the first time. So sure, maybe there's you know, a city like London who did it not too long ago, but they did it before, but it was you know, so many decades, you know, the people around were not around anymore. So, so if, you're, if you're in the series of every four years Olympic Games events, you've got this problem of eternal beginner, beginner syndrome. And I reflected that this is actually also quite applicable to digital transformation. I mean, once again, the word says it, right? An organization or a group that wants to transform digitally is probably not something they do every year. It, oh, the fact that it's a transformation, there is normally that bold thing that we're moving toward. It's quite likely that the organization does not have experience with that. That is, is therefore, in effect, a beginner. And even if the organization has had an area, let's say the procurement uh, part of the organization or the business, let's say they had transformed already. That doesn't mean the, but now the sales area starts or the marketing or whatever the case may be. Uh, they would be beginners at it. So like Olympic host cities, organizations that do digital transformation are, are do what they're doing, likely with a lack of experience. And that would both be the knowing how to do stuff or, and I'm going to put quite a bit of emphasis on this today, that type of tacit knowledge, knowing how to respond to things when they actually go wrong. Um, uh, another great book, if you are interested in failure, which I am, because I'm often called to kind of try and resolve failure, uh, a book called The Logic of Failure by Dietrich Dörner, it already came out in the late 90s. Um, he speaks about something called operational wisdom which is the wisdom that gets built up over time by people and teams when they do big things. Um, uh, and that wisdom is not measured in terms of them knowing how to start, but them often being able to send the signals of danger that's coming from far away and to start reacting to that very early. Now, if you're suffering, whether you're Olympic Games host city or a digital trans or an organization planning digital transformation, if you're in that beginner status, it's quite likely that you miss that uh, tacit knowledge. Then, and the picture behind me um, is a satellite image of some time of the city of Barcelona, which I'm, I've never been to, amazingly enough. I'm going there at the, at the end of November for something, which is quite fantastic, so I thought it's a good one to use. Um, and what you see behind you, all those, all those pinkish purple bits, uh, those are the parts of Barcelona where stadiums were built, neighborhoods were flattened and Olympic villages constructed. 
um, roads were maybe widened, tram lines lengthened, uh, all the various things that a city such as Barcelona would have done to get ready for the Olympic Games. And, and, and it's just a nice visual to, to remind us that it's quite likely that if you're a city and you are going to host it, you're not going to build it all in the hills next door, right? You almost then have to create a second city. So more than likely, you are building all these new things to integrate into the old. Similarly with digital transformation, and for those closer to the technology space will know that while some companies do go and put together a new co or some sort of new organization that will become their disruptive arm in the market, um, more than likely, even if that isn't done, there's that close integration into the, into the legacy world. So that means that both these type of initiatives have huge dependencies to contend with between old and new. And often, certainly from what I see, quite naive assumptions about how easy or, or difficult, how, how easy it may be to actually integrate the old and new, right? Um, and I think this is probably familiar to many of you. And, th and that integration is essential. I mean, just like the city has to integrate with, electricity, with the existing electricity lines. An organization that wants to digitally transform need the data, for example, as, as, as one good example, need the, uh, so the, the, the power of the new digital experience that's being enrolled out, supporting whatever product it might be, uh, is really enhanced if the data that the firm already has and their older systems, older stuff can be utilized to actually drive those experiences. So it's vital for both, but it's quite likely to present obstacles that during planning would not have been seen. And this is a, something that really then amplifies uh, planning fallacy. Then you've got competing success criteria. And I'm, I'm sure this is familiar to all of you as well. Just like in Barcelona, no doubt some people care deeply for the, for the fact that the city needed to become a host uh, because of city pride or national pride, maybe development of the region for socioeconomic regions, uh, beautification, just aesthetic reasons, uh, or yes, and maybe that's linked to that one, uh, to become a tourist destination, uh, you know, um, afterwards, if it is successful. So very, uh, so very different, different type of initiatives. And the same with digital transformation. You know, I was at, uh, at one of the bigger transformations that I was part of, uh, got stuck with this exact thing where what does good look like was just seen differently by different parties. On the one hand, there was a, yes, we'll roll out this new suite of products to compete within the market. And then there was, well, while we're doing that, we may as well change how people will experience when they engage with these products. So let's actually also transform our customer experience. But since we're doing that, actually, we have all these old systems on the mainframe. So in fact, this is a great time for us to get off mainframe systems as well, right? So quite, quite, uh, quite distinct, very different success criteria. On the face of it, it looks like that by doing it all together, you can get five birds with one stone. But of course, for every one success criteria competes with another, when you get to those decision trade-offs, and we heard earlier about strategy and trade-offs, and that really is the sort of the heart of strategy, the ability to make decisions around trade-offs. It just means that when you were planning, you may not picture the time it may take or the obstacles that may appear because of these type of competing criteria, trade-off decisions that will, that will be made. And another element, well, and I've witnessed it, and that's what studies of digital transformation uh, program failure also tells us, is that whenever you have this, you've got fear and trust. I'm afraid that you'll be successful with your tourist destination thing because I'm worried that we'll lose our focus on social upliftment. So I may not trust you. I may even resist you, which slows it all down even more. Um, and then the last one, uh, which is that with both these type of initiatives, let's take digital transformation first. It's only until, until the experience that you are designing, the digital experience that is typical of why we do digital transformation or the insights from the data that we're looking for when we do digital transformation. It's only when those emerge that you really can see the benefits uh, or the actual effects of it, right? Um, and the same with an Olympic city in Barcelona. Sorry, I'm using Barcelona now, but, but it's, it, they couldn't have they couldn't have confidently said that tourist numbers would have picked up after they after their Olympics. Now the funny thing is in Barcelona, 
we're speaking about Olympic failures, but Barcelona is actually, along with probably the Los Angeles games, uh, the two that are considered great uh, great success as Barcelona did become one of the tourist hotspots of Spain and a lot of other benefits came with it. Now, uh, 20, uh, well, actually almost 30 years later, um, there's the challenge that, that Barcelona is overrun by tourists. So 30 years later, there's an impact that the, that the citizens are not necessarily that comfortable with. But, but why am I mentioning this as something that they share since both these type of initiatives, digital transformation, since it's not clear what the benefits are, what the impact will be when you're done. Of course, uh, planning fallacy can get you in even deeper trouble. Of course, it's more likely that since it isn't clear that I mentioned like competing criteria gets amplified. Um, so this one just amplifies the others, raising uncertainty. So several perhaps not perhaps not that surprising to you, but I think certainly sort of interesting similarities right between uh, doing digital transformation in our organizations today and the type of uh, type of both bias and other quite practical challenges that a city will have that's preparing for the Olympic Games. And each of these five points we can probably discuss at length. Um, and I, I thought that, you know, if I do, and I've mentioned it earlier that I do get called uh, when programs get into trouble, um, you know, when there's a failure, when something needs to become unstuck. Sometimes it sadly means that it's stopped. Sometimes, you know, we recover it and we move it forward. So that's that's the type of thing that I do a lot. And I, I you know, it, it's an, it's always an, an interesting, interesting experience because when you when you look at a failure, when you look at things going wrong, you know, you you find interesting similarities between clients and the type of problems that they have. And, and, and number one, on the one side and the other side, almost increasingly or invariably, I find that, or I ask myself, that if the people that were involved had the experience of doing this before, would they not have seen the danger signs earlier? And so I thought of all the various things that we can discuss today. Let's focus a little bit on, on experience. And of course, experience is something that you can have at the start when you are planning. Uh, and then there's the fact that while you're doing, you build experience, which is, which is learning. So a few factors that I think are useful in terms of injecting experience either up front, um, either up front in, while you uh, are planning uh, or building up that experience as you go. But uh, maybe at, since that's kind of the, the halfway point from looking at root causes and then looking at lessons, you know, a moment of moral philosophy, that my same uh, Dietrich Döner, um, writes this, I think, so indeed, as, the, as per the sign, an uncomfortable truth. You know, it's an interesting question, right? What is more damage in society and the world? Where the people with good intent who wanted to do the right thing, but doing it without the right level of competence, versus people with poor intent, but actually with intelligence and competence. So the rest of this discussion is really about how, to, how do you make sure that if you and your team and your colleagues uh, your organizations, if you have that good intent, how do you make sure? Or how do you give yourself a better chance of having the competence so that you're not confronted with that inconvenient truth? So the first one is naturally obvious, right? If you want to inject experience into your planning and execution process, choose people with that experience. So I'm not going to spend much time on it because it may seem very obvious to everybody. But the only thing I want to mention is that, uh, that we're not just here, peak, and, and there's a reason why I meant leaders and teams. It's not just about the individuals. It's not about getting five experienced hotshots that know their way about uh, this particular type of transformation that you're busy doing, but it's often about how, how they work together. So if you can get a team of people uh, that have actually done this before and that bring the experience not just of, of doing the individual tasks, but actually bring the experience of having been productive and effective before. If they can bring that into your high-risk initiative, you stand a better chance because then you have a better chance of having that, op that, remember that operational wisdom there from the start. The second item is a, a reminder that while you're planning, you're probably not as unique as you think. I think there was reference to that earlier as well. This idea that 
it's our organization in our place, in our city, in our country, and therefore we need to come up with the unique things towards our very, very special, very, very different strategy. It's more than likely that there are others that have planned and done what you are now planning to do. So as far as possible, if you can, open, you know, open minds and see, do that research. This is the golden research. Bring that into your own planning process. And of course, a very useful way to combat, uh, combat planning fallacy. Then, then remember that I, I, I had that term eternal, bigger, uh, eternal uh, beginner syndrome, which was coined to describe uh, the fact that every four years, it will always be a beginner Olympic city or host city doing the Olympics. And there was actually another study that criticized that study, as these studies go, <laughs> which said that, you know, it, it, it may be true that a city is hosting the Olympic Games for the first time, which holistically, of course, is a big thing to do as a, a sort of an integrated event. But no doubt someone in that city have built a swimming pool before, and maybe someone have extended a gas line, and maybe they've broadened a road and built a stadium even. Maybe they've demolished buildings and they've built apartment blocks that are now Olympic Games. So, so, so not the entire thing is new. And, and one should be careful not to exaggerate the beginnerness or the newness of all aspects. And I, and, and, and I've, 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 I cannot, I think this applies so, so well to digital transformation as well, particularly where there's that seduction to go for the latest and greatest technology. So I, I, I've, I've certainly always encouraged in, in this big integrated sort of systemic change that's normally presented by digital transformation to go, what can be reused? Which building blocks already work in the organization? Must all aspects be new? Maybe the particular point of experience from the customer is new. Maybe you're using machine learning and AI in a new way to look at the data that exists. Um, but perhaps there are several other things that need to come together here where you have your own teams already doing it, uh, or you can actually import people that know. So if you can do tried and test it, mix that up with the new and novel. And then also the thing that you actually don't have to do all your innovation. That links a little bit to the uniqueness. People always having to think that I must solve all my own problems on my own. It's quite likely that your problem has been solved before. Or if you use, you know, the type of platforms that we can use nowadays, uh, hyperscale cloud platforms and others, where those companies and other clients are pouring billions of dollars into innovation on those platforms. So use a platform that others are using already that are doing the innovation for you. That brings down, that also injects the experience, rather I should say, in your transformation program. And then there's the reminder that, that this project or program is not the first one ever in your organization and its ecosystem. There was another study done by a failure of IT programs that showed that one of the big issues is that people sort of turn the page, they close the book on the thing of last year, whether it was a success or a failure, we did that, it didn't work out well, but hey, we can, uh, uh, let's start a new thing with new people and we, we won't repeat what happened. An idea, and it's back. Um, the fact is that since you are doing this in the same ecosystem, even if, it's, even if it's now maybe a more novel type of work, the constraints and blockers and processes that your colleagues struggled with two years ago when another program failed, you're probably going to confront that too. I mean, I, I saw this just a, a week ago, not a program level, but a particular blocker in sort of two weeks before go live where um, whether something didn't work. And so the solution was, well, all we need to do is get that new piece of technology, we'll implement that, and within two months, we'll, things will be working again. And then I, had, I asked this question, well, last year we also put something new out in, and it took nine months. And yes, but that wasn't, well, it wasn't, Okay, <laughs> it wasn't the tech, um, you know, it was the governance process and how long the architects to agree to it and how long it took to sign contracts. And then we had to get the infrastructure team to put security in place, et cetera, et cetera. So the question is, those things have not changed, right? Unless there's been a revolution in your organization, you're gonna struggle with those same uh, things. So don't, don't forget about the experience of similar or even very different projects in your own ecosystem. 
We've spoken a lot about experience, how to bring it in. Now let's switch for the last last two about uh, how to inject in experience. And the first uh, inject experience. And the first is 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 of course to accelerate it through planning and simulation. When I say planning here, I don't mean the type of planning that one does with stickies on a wall or in a Microsoft project plan, but actually the plan is a process whereby you are prototyping, testing, experimenting. And and, and I think this is a space, uh, certainly I think in the for myself in the next few years of my career that, that I think a lot of us are going to get much closer to. Uh, you know the concept of a digital twin, whereby you using um, sort of technology, machine learning, to to run through simulations of your initiative prior to actually doing it. It will never replace the, the the reality of the real world, but it is a way of building up that experience. Once again, that operational wisdom of the type of things that uh, that go wrong. And this is this is not new. It's not just because we have better tools now. It's just that we have better tools to do this type of experience acceleration. And then perhaps uh, we spoke uh, earlier about about smart and being able to measure. Um, probably the the second question that I ask uh, when I'm asked to look at programs that I do get into trouble is is to ask whether the team the leaders know they know whether they are where they where they are in relation to where they actually want to be. Uh, you know, so you're in sprint 12, you've got 17 sprints, but you're only 30 percent. And, and the team's ability, it, it's quite amazing. Uh, the, the, this is much harder for many teams than, than we might think. So to track and measure your progress, where are we now in relation with where we want to be? Um, how much of our funds and resources have we consumed? And what do we have left in relation with what we still need to finish? And that's now whether it's the big vision three years from now or the sprint two weeks away. And finally, of course, our ability to understand uncertainty and risk and to be able to quantify that. Uh, so the measurement, the data around this is a key thing to inject learning and experience into the team so that we can respond to it. And finally, if you're going to use learning to get experience and experience fast, you need to be set up to, to nurture and support learning. And I'm I'm almost out of time, so luckily there was a great example earlier about the um, comparison between the robot, the traffic light, and the traffic circle. I'll, I won't say anything more if there's anything that symbolizes this learning-friendly environment versus not that, that is uh, probably it. And then, of course, having learned these things, having built up the experience, how have we organized ourselves to actually be adaptable and respond to it? So. A few key things we can do, either to get the experience in or get the experience along the way. If we do these things, I think that we stand a better chance of avoiding that terrible red line on that first slide where we are doing digital transformation projects that, when they go wrong, go disastrously wrong. Thanks, everyone. I think my time went up. Any questions? Thank you, Hank. Um, again, I think just so that we can get you know get some time back. If you'll see Hank just now at lunchtime, you can ask him some questions, uh, particularly what it was like how he had to be agile with that microphone not working all the time. <laughs> no, sorry about that. No problem. No problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, just for those so people, uh, uh, we are we will actually have these slides uh, available to everybody, so you don't need to necessarily be taking. Uh, yeah, so um, Hank, thanks very much. Anybody want to catch Hank afterwards and ask him a question? We'd really, really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everyone.